Hello everyone, my name is Sergey Danilenko and I'm a head of marketing in Private Bank. Today we're going to talk about blockchain and Bitcoin technology. What is that special about Bitcoin? Is it a revolution or a bubble? What are some awesome possibilities that offer us Bitcoin? What are the dangers of technology? We are broadcasting live from Private Bank headquarters in Dnipropetrovsk and we have a special guest today, Nicholas Carey. I think he is kind of a legendary person. Nicholas is a co-founder of blockchain.com website and also of the most popular in the world Bitcoin wallet. I invite everyone to ask questions right on the main page of Private24 website. I will read those questions to Nicholas. So, Nicholas, welcome to Ukraine. What is that special about our country that attracted your attention? Why is Ukraine is important for the uh, world's Bitcoin community? Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm having an incredible time here in the Ukraine. Um, the last year, I have traveled probably 350,000 miles. I have been to every continent, and I have met with developers and university students and regulators and leaders of countries all over the world to talk to them about Bitcoin and blockchain technology and share with them a little bit about what we're learning in the industry and why this is such an important innovation. And the implications are really quite dramatic. Um, but for the first time in the history of the world, we have the ability to send value from one place anywhere else instantly, nearly for free. So if there's one thing to take away from this, imagine a world with frictionless transactions where you can send value and essentially uh, basically send money via email just as easily as you would with uh, a browser. So we're very excited about the opportunities in the industry. My company is one of the fastest growing technology companies in the world. So uh, we're adding about 80,000 new users a week that are downloading wallets. And uh, one of the Did you say 80,000? 80,000 80, and, um, and sometimes more. And the reason we came to the Ukraine uh, was really we're seeing explosive growth across Eastern Europe. And one of the reasons um, we're here is to learn a little bit more about why that might be. <laughs> Uh, did you learn? <laughs> I think it's an ongoing study, um, but we're going to be sharing a bit more about uh, one of the reasons for that, I think, soon. Okay, uh, let's go to the basics. Uh, Nicholas, would you explain us what the Bitcoin actually is? Uh, I assume that lots of geeks are watching us at this very moment, but what if you had to explain Bitcoin to a 15th century farmer, for example? Oh, that would be difficult. Explaining... Um, a rocket ship to a 15th century farmer or even hot water coming out of a tap um, would be difficult. But uh, maybe if I was trying to explain Bitcoin to your mother, okay. um, I would uh, try a few different strategies. Um, Bitcoin is one of the most widely misunderstood concepts in the technology space today. Um, so we have a lot of work to do to demystify it and make it less scary. Um, very practically, Bitcoin is a couple things. It's a technology. It's a protocol for value transfer for the internet, and it's a really big network. So we use transaction networks every single day in our lives. Companies like PayPal, MasterCard, and Visa are examples of transaction networks. We rely on them because they allow us to send value between places. But these um, networks are centralized, and they have very high costs. And so the Bitcoin project is essentially an attempt to completely replace those mm -hmm. and use the internet for value transfer. So it's a network for value transfer, and it also has a currency that you can use in order to send money anywhere in the world. Uh, okay, great then. Uh, what is blockchain then? <laughs> so blockchain is the key technology that allows Bitcoin to function. So when people ask me, what is the blockchain? Uh, the blockchain is basically a big spreadsheet in the cloud. And so it's important to understand the difference between the blockchain and how a normal transaction network um, like Visa, Amex, or MasterCard works. So mm -hmm. let me try and explain it. Visa, MasterCard, and Amex have processing centers that they manage with huge banks of computers all over the world. But if one of those has a downtime event, or if a meteorite hits it, it's going to go offline and uh, transactions won't process. Mm -hmm. The Bitcoin network replicates this by essentially allowing anyone in the world to download a piece of software and run it on their computer mm -hmm. and help keep the network secure. So you basically create nodes or copies of this big spreadsheet all over the world. And it's what's called an immutable record keeping system, mm -hmm. an immutable database. And so when a transaction is made between two people, it gets sent to all of those copies all over the world instantly. And so if one of the copies goes offline, the network maintains its integrity. 
So it's a really, really secure way to basically manage transactions. So, so does it mean that if we talk about blockchain as an open ledger, uh, does it mean that I can see that someone bought pizza from, <laughs> from, from pizzeria? So when you make a transaction on the Bitcoin network, here's how it works. Um, basically, two people can have a wallet, and you can go visit blockchain.info and download a wallet today. And if you have a wallet and you show me an address, I can send you Bitcoin to that. It's just like email. So if I wanted to send you an email, you would give me an email address, and I would send you a message and click send, and it would instantly get to you. In Bitcoin, you can have an address in your wallet and show it to someone, and then they can send you value anywhere in the world. So imagine being here in the Ukraine and having a friend of yours that's in the United States or down in South mm -hmm. America. You could send them value instantly just as easily as you could with an email address. Oh. Sometimes people compare Bitcoin to gold. Uh, what's the similarities between these two things? Yeah, that's a really great question. So um, it's kind of hard to talk about Bitcoin without talking about money in general and the properties that money has and why we use it. This is a really personal topic for most people. We spend our entire lives in pursuit of money in our careers so that we can improve our lives. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the properties of money in general. Mm -hmm. um, you know, human beings have invented all kinds of things in the history of time to make our lives better. We used to live in caves, and then we invented the wheel. We made roads. We built cars so we could travel. So we've made things uh, more efficient. Why can't we invent a better form of money? So I submit that Bitcoin is a really exciting experiment to try and reimagine how money would work if we could start it from scratch and invent it so that it would be purposeful in the age of the internet. So if I wanted to make a better form of money, I would want my money to be purely digital. I'd want it to be impossible to counterfeit. I'd want to be able to divide it and recombine it so it needs to be fungible. And um, it should be very easy to send anywhere in the world. So I shouldn't have to be able, I shouldn't have to worry about packaging it and hiring security guards and then wiring money and having it take three days. It should be as fast to send value as it is in email. And the last one is really, really important. I would design in my money the ability for it to be scarce. And this is critical to understand. There's a reason why we don't use snowflakes or grains of sand as money, because in order for uh, things to have value, they need to be scarce. If there's an unlimited amount of them, then there's inflation and uh, there's less value to the things you possess. Bitcoin has all of those properties designed into it digitally. So it's a really big deal. It's the world's first scarce digital commodity. It's completely digital. It's frictionless in the transactions, and it's a scarce resource. And so people often say um, Bitcoin is a little bit like a digital gold. And uh, there's a great book you can read called Digital Gold by Nathaniel Popper, who's a New York Times bestselling author. And it describes kind of the history of Bitcoin. Um, so he chose the title for his book for a good mm -hmm. reason. And that's why people call it um, essentially uh, a value that mimics gold, but is actually in some ways superior to gold. We don't use gold anymore because it's impractical. I can't pay you for a bet I lost um, in a soccer match three ounces of gold because I'd have to sit there and shave it off and carve it. And so um, at some point over the last century, they invented paper and it used to be backed uh, by gold and that's how a lot of our currencies worked. And then in the 1970s, they divorced from that concept and uh, central banks all over the world started making lots and lots and lots of money. And um, this is pretty controversial because every single time they increase the amount of money, mm -hmm. what happens to all of our savings? Well, we actually lose value. And so we have to earn more money. And the problem across the global economy in some ways is that wages have not kept up with the loss mm -hmm. of value from the printing of more money. So Bitcoin acts as a correction to this. Um, it's a deflationary currency. There's a fixed supply. But all those other properties of it, the fact that it's digital, you can send it anywhere in the world, it's fungible. Um, it's a really interesting uh, alternative. And my point of view is that there will be many um, competing currencies in the future, and I think digital currencies will play a very important role in the global economy. So where do Bitcoins come from? So the network on Bitcoin is now actually uh, going on seven years. So it was launched in uh, 2008, um, and there's a lot of uh, great stories about the old days of Bitcoin. But it's important to note that there is basically no back-end banking system that has stayed online as robustly as the Bitcoin network has been running. It doesn't have bank holidays. It runs 365 days a year, securing transactions and allowing people to send value anywhere in the world. 
When the network was launched, part of the programming releases new Bitcoins into circulation. So it's a replacement for the federal banking system in some ways. Anyone in the world can download a piece of software and help secure the network. By doing so, they're occasionally rewarded with newly created Bitcoins. So it's part of the computer program. New Bitcoins come into circulation and get distributed to the people that help make the so network secure. Th th does it mean that any Ukrainian can basically download this piece of software and become rich eventually by mining <laughs> Bitcoins? Um, you used to be able to run it on a laptop just like this one, but because uh, the Bitcoin project has captured the imagination of so many people, um, people actually invented really specific devices to mine Bitcoins. So we call the people that secure the Bitcoin network miners. So anyone can download the software, but now you actually need more specialized equipment to uh, help uh, secure the network. So it'd be more difficult than it used to be for anyone to just get rich. Uh, <laughs> okay, still, if I would ask you to assume uh, how much Bitcoins can you make with a laptop in a year? Ooh. What would be the answer? I think you would probably make less than a penny. Uh, so uh -huh. you really need to invest in the special equipment if you want to, uh, if you want to help secure the network. Uh, okay, uh, well, uh, then is there a limit to the amount of Bitcoin that can be generated and what happens when the limit is reached. Right, so um, remember when I talked about how Bitcoin has uh, scarcity designed into it. So there are only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoins. And at first that's kind of like, well that's not enough. What if it becomes a global currency? There are billions of people. Um, well, Bitcoin can be divided by up to eight decimal points. So there are over four quadrillion units of Bitcoin's potential. Um, so that's more than enough to facilitate all kinds of commerce. So uh, we can put those concerns at ease. Um, but the limit of 21 million Bitcoins will be reached in the year 2144. So the way it works is every couple of years, the number of Bitcoins that gets rewarded to the people that secure the network goes down by half. So we call it a Bitcoin halving. And in 2016, the number of Bitcoins that come into circulation will again halve from the previous um, drop. And so essentially, Fewer coins come into circulation over the course of time. And there's a lot of uh, speculation as to what will happen in the year 2144. How will the network continue to run if people aren't getting rewarded uh, mm -hmm. in Bitcoin? Well, the answer um, is that there will most likely be a fee market that gets uh, invented for the transactions themselves. But the cost will always be driving closer to zero and is by far the most efficient way to send value in the world today. Okay, talking about sending value, uh, what are the fees involved here? So, if I wanted to send you a Bitcoin transaction, um, I would have a wallet, I would need to have some Bitcoin, and then I could send it to you. When I make that uh, transaction happen, there are optional fees that I can pay to the network. The fees are very, very small, usually less than a penny, but they're totally voluntary. So it's kind of a way to incentivize the network itself, and the fees come down to the individuals. But Here's where it's really important. Uh, to who get those fees? So the fees go to the miners on the network. So every 10 minutes, they get a collection of those fees um, that are happening on the overall Bitcoin blockchain. So compare that, though, to what it costs right now to send an international money transfer from the Ukraine to London. It's actually faster for me to come here and FedEx or DHL this desk from here to London than it is to send money, which is just crazy in 2016. But that's how it works. The system was designed 40 years ago, and it uh, predates the existence of the internet. So we really need to have a better way to do this. But if I wanted to send a wire to the UK from here, I would need to go to my bank. I would need to show them a picture of myself. I would fill out all this paperwork. On the recipient side, the same thing would happen. The banker would take this. They would go to the compliance person. The compliance person would approve it. It would go to a Forex market. Someone would buy and sell some money. Then T plus three days, which is the average settlement time in an international transaction, would occur, and the money would eventually get to the other side. But the cost of that transaction is a couple things. One, um, international wires are usually $50 at least, and then you lose three days without your money. And in that time, the bank is earning interest on all those funds. So companies like Western Union and MoneyGram that facilitate international money transfer um, they're going to be severely disrupted by this type of technology. Uh, right now, there's a $500 billion market in international remittances. So a remittance is when someone sends money back home 
across a border. So there are migrant workers and there are people that live in different countries that send money back home to their friends and family. In a lot of cases, these are some of the poorest people in the world sending money back home to support their families. And right now, they have to go to these companies, spend up to 15 to sometimes 20 or 30 percent of the cost of the transaction just to get money back home to feed their families. Um, I think that that's wrong and I think there's a better way. And so Bitcoin presents an open source solution to sending value across borders. And that's just one really specific example where it hasn't been solved for yet and Bitcoin provides a really elegant way for people to send money across borders. Do you mean that is a chance for underbanked people in poor countries? Yeah, if we look globally, um, there are 2.5 billion people in the world that don't have access to financial services whatsoever. So they don't have bank accounts. Four billion people don't have credit cards or debit cards. Uh, this represents an enormous opportunity because you know what these people do have? They have smartphones. They have connectivity to the web. So with that, they can go download a blockchain wallet or other wallets and instantly set up a bank on their phone. They can be their own bank. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the reasons we're seeing really strong growth, we think, in Eastern Europe and in frontier and emerging markets around the world. These are places where banking infrastructure has lagged and hasn't been able to provide services to people. And so the opportunities, especially for people that are currently unbanked, are very, very big. What are the barriers? The barriers to adoption in Bitcoin um, are probably that it's a really intimidating topic at first. You hear the word, you hear maybe digital currency, some people will talk about cryptocurrency, and those things can uh, sound a little bit uh, confusing. I think most importantly, um, it's, impor it's important to understand that most of us rely on technology every single day in our lives that's actually pretty complex. So uh, I, met, I imagine many of our viewers today use email every single day or text messaging, but they don't have any idea how that actually works under the covers. But um, we use it because we trust it and we can rely upon it. So when I send someone an email, I know they get it. Um, and the thing is that we have to build better software to make Bitcoin more approachable. Fundamentally, it's easy to use. It allows anyone in the world, wherever they are, to instantly start to accept payments. Um, it doesn't care what color you are, what your gender is, um, what your credit score looks like. Anyone can download open source software for free, put it on their phone, and start to transact with anybody else in the world just as easily as setting up an email account. And if you compare the experience of downloading a wallet in 30 seconds on your phone to what it would take to go set up a bank account, where you have to show up with paperwork, you have to show up with tons of IDs and prove who you are and all these things. Um, that's no longer a necessary thing. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about blockchain. Uh, people often say that there are some not Bitcoin applications for blockchain technology. Uh, what are some of those? Yeah, so let's talk and remind everybody about what a blockchain is. So the Bitcoin blockchain is the core innovation of the entire network. It's a bunch of copies of a database that live all over the world. So when you have an immutable record keeping system, the first kind of prototype of an application is basically money. If you have a record keeping system that stays the same, a ledger, then you can send money anywhere in the world and the system acknowledges the state of itself. That's important. Mm -hmm. Once you have that though, you can actually store other information in the blockchain. So there are a lot of exciting um, potential use cases here, and I'll describe a few. Um, the World Economic Forum is studying using the Bitcoin blockchain for identity management systems. So this is actually a big deal. Um, right now, the rate of online fraud last year outpaced growth in online e-commerce. There are lots of famous cases over the past 12 months of service providers getting hacked and losing tons of personal information. So we had Sony, there was JP Morgan, the US government lost its federal database, uh, Target, um, many others were attacked by uh, cyber um, attackers and lost all this personal information for users. And the reason that happens is these companies are forced in many cases to collect personal data, but what happens is that data is very difficult to secure and when you pile a lot of it together, it's almost like an online bank and then people want to go in there and steal it. So a smarter way to design um, privacy for the internet is actually to distribute people's personal data and hand it back over to the individuals. And so using blockchain technology, you could actually create identity systems, basically passports that live on your phone, and you only share what you need to share with the service providers on the web when you need to. 
And so identity management systems are one example of how um, you could use the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, asset tracking is a really exciting opportunity. So people um, own all kinds of things. They own cars, they own homes, they own stocks and bonds. And uh, right now, it's kind of difficult to share or trade those when they want to exchange them. Um, the uh, NASDAQ in New York is experimenting with blockchain technology for internal settlement of shares. Um, TO is a project run by uh, Patrick Byrne, who's the founder and CEO of Overstock, um, again using the Bitcoin blockchain as um, a digital asset clearing system. And so essentially, you would attach um, maybe a share of a stock in a company to a Bitcoin transaction, and imagine being able to send that easily anywhere in the world to anyone you wanted to without having to go to um, a clearing house, a merchant exchange, um, or any of those things. So uh, digital assets are going to be really, really important in the future, and they'll be back to using things like the Bitcoin blockchain. So you've got identity management systems. You've got digital assets. Um, payments are a really obvious one. Uh, and so right now, the kind of most common use case for Bitcoin is people making payments for digital goods. You can spend Bitcoin at Microsoft, at Dell, at Overstock.com, at Wikipedia, and hundreds of thousands of merchants on the internet. All of these big companies are accepting Bitcoin today. And they do it because when they accept that transaction, they get 100% of the value. So if you're a small business or a big business and you want to accept um, payment online, your choices today are basically credit cards or bank transfers. Those options aren't very good for you. And the reason is every time someone uses a credit card, there's a 2 to 3% fee associated with that. And so the merchant has to accept that they're going to lose a little bit of the value just to sell you a good. Well, Bitcoin allows them to accept 100% of the value of the payment and uh, there's no chargeback risk. And most of the people that have been doing and accepting Bitcoin have experienced zero fraud. So if you're an online company or a regular company, you can accept Bitcoin right now. And uh, I think following in the lead of some of those big corporations uh, should make more people comfortable accepting Bitcoin. Those businesses represent hundreds of billions of dollars of market capitalization. They have done their research. They're accepting Bitcoin for a good reason. It's more efficient and they get to keep more money. What about digital signatures? So uh, this is another area, uh, and I'm glad you brought it up. So we've got identity management, digital assets, um, payments, um, and digital signatures. So notary services are used all over the world to verify and prove that something happened. So if I um, have to uh, buy a house, I have to sometimes go to the notary, and they stamp things, and uh, then we know that they have approved it. Well, using, the di uh, using digital signatures, you could actually use the Bitcoin blockchain as a notary service. And there are a couple companies now supporting this. So I think you can see that the, the overall industry and the scope of it is enormous. You're talking about payments, which is a quadrillion uh, value a year in payments are happening all over the world. Um, there are $7.7 .7 billion in credit card transactions that cost consumers hundreds of billions of dollars a year. You have global remittances, where people are sending money back home to their families. That's a $500 billion a year market. Digital assets, identity systems, passports, and more are just the tip of the iceberg. And so Bitcoin presents an elegant and interesting solution for many of these problems. I don't know if it's going to win in all of those cases, but all it has to do is win in a couple of them or take 5 or 10% of those markets, and the value of the Bitcoin network will be incredible. We have an interesting question from the audience. Uh, who benefits? So the viewer says that from traditional money, uh, governments do benefit, states do benefit. Uh, who benefits from Bitcoin? Isn't that kind of a bubble or a scam just to bring up more Bitcoins and uh, earn money for those who are early miners of Bitcoin? Yeah. So. Um, there have been many criticisms lobbied at Bitcoin. Uh, one, that it was, um, it was immature, uh, that it was too complex or too complicated, that the economics didn't make sense, um, that uh, it looked and behaved um, uh, radically, or maybe that it was a bubble. And uh, I think that um, a lot of people were afraid of rock and roll in the 1970s, and they said that it would bring around the, the end of times and that it was scary and that you know, people shouldn't pay attention or listen to it. People develop a sense of comfort with things over time, and uh, money and payments is a particularly sensitive area. Um, 
When it comes down to uh, early adopters of Bitcoin, it's true that the value of Bitcoin has grown a lot over the last year. Um, Bloomberg reported that in 2015, Bitcoin was the best performing global currency, period. So if you wanted to protect your value in 2015 and you decided to uh, put some of your money in dollars and some of your money in pounds, in yen, and if you had put it in Russian rubles or the Chinese stock market, you would have gotten crushed. But if you had put it in Bitcoin, you would have had the best performing, digital, uh, best performing currency class, period. And uh, the reason why um, is because there's a huge amount of investment happening in Bitcoin. You've got entrepreneurs and startups all over the world building a new financial system that's far more efficient than the old one. Um, at the very core of what Bitcoin is, it's an open payments platform. And that's really important. Today, all of our payment systems are relatively closed. Many of them don't talk to each other. There's no interoperability. And they aren't ready to scale for the age of the internet. Bitcoin replaces them. And so, who benefits? Well, the prices will drop everywhere in the world if you don't. It's have basically, to everyone. Yeah, you everyone, say everyone benefits. benefits. Society benefits as a whole. It's like saying who benefits from the internet, right? Do governments not benefit because now they can't control information as carefully? Of course not. Civilians get more access to news. They can do better job of education. Um, the internet is a, a corollary to how Bitcoin will help the world benefit. If we thought the printing press was a good invention because it allowed people to share ideas. Um, why can't we have more competition in money? And I think that that's a really important question. We generally believe that competition helps lower prices, create more innovation. Well, Bitcoin is just one attempt to create a better form of money that anyone in the world can use. Doesn't matter what color your skin is or where you were born or where you live. Just as easy as you can sign up for an email account, you can start to use Bitcoin. Okay, uh, what about speculation? So, how many people do actually use Bitcoin to buy stuff? And how many people, or what is the percentage who are speculating on the markets. Yeah, uh, so over the last few years, there have definitely been um, people speculating in Bitcoin. And uh, for all the reasons I described, where if any of those outcome uh, happen, the value of Bitcoin will be very, very high. So you have people that have come in and are speculating on markets um, in Bitcoin. And so that creates price volatility. I will submit that that's still a very uh, big barrier for consumer adoption today, which is you might look at the price of Bitcoin and see that it's $450 today. And tomorrow, you could see that it's 470 or 440. And so it moves around quite a bit. Um, and I think that uh, creates some apprehension uh, that's legitimate for people. Um, and I think it's going to be volatile for a while. And uh, that's because it's going to take time for a natural price to get developed in this market. My hope is that it sort of gradually continues to grow. And I think that'll be the overall trend. In the last five years, the total volatility of Bitcoin year over year has dropped but it has grown in value um, quite a bit since uh, it was started. Uh, let's talk about technology. Let's go back to this part of the story. Uh, yesterday you told that you are going to develop an algorithm by the end of the year that will increase the speed of transaction. Yeah, so right now, um, Bitcoin, I will say, is really still in its infancy. So there's sort of this misconception that people feel like they've missed the boat or that uh, Bitcoin um, is now uh, too far along for them to get involved. I tell people all the time, I still think we're very much in the early stages. So everyone listening today is really, you're some of the first people to really invest in learning more about um, why Bitcoin is such an important innovation. So if the entire history of Bitcoin was a clock, I think we're only in like the third or fourth second of time. Uh, there's still a huge amount of runway in front of us from a development perspective, from the things we need to do technically, from an education perspective and more. So let's talk a little bit about some of the current limitations. Right now, the total cap uh, capacity of the Bitcoin network can move about six or seven transactions a second. That's actually not very much. Visa, MasterCard and Amex can do far more. So, really brilliant developers all over the planet are working on new solutions to increase that uh, throughput and have up to uh, maybe millions of transactions moving through the Bitcoin blockchain at some point. And when you have that, you have a global payment network that allows devices to start to talk to each other. Right now, most payments in the world are done between people and institutions or peer-to-peer -peer payments. But in five to 10 years, they're gonna be machine-to-machine -machine payments. And we need to have a payment infrastructure that lives globally, that allows digital devices to negotiate with each other and send value back and forth. In order for that to be possible, you have to have a payment network that can do microtransactions. Microtransactions are inherently enabled by Bitcoin. That means sending a tiny amount of money. 
So if I wanted to send you one one hundred thousandth of a penny, it's super impractical for me to do that today. In fact, I can't. There's no payment network in the world for this. But uh, the Bitcoin network supports them. The trouble is we just haven't sorted out for the volume yet. And uh, there's a proposal among many. One of them that we're researching is called the Lightning Network that would allow for m an order of magnitude more transactions that are supported by any other payment network. And uh, we're hopeful to see some progress on that by the oh, end of this year. What is the average speed of transfer today? So if I send someone a Bitcoin transaction, they will see it instantly on the other side. So they will look at the Bitcoin blockchain and uh, they'll notice that the balance of their wallet has increased. However, it takes 10 minutes for the Bitcoin network to confirm a transaction. And so generally speaking, it's safe to wait uh, 10 minutes before you send those funds. It's still away. okay. It's still cool. It's like from one minute to 10 minutes, even for one dollar. Yeah. So here's the thing. Bitcoin right now is probably not the ideal payment method for going to buy a cup of coffee. But for making an international payment, for receiving a salary, um, for settling up with a friend for a non-urgent payment, 10 minutes I think is a fairly acceptable window of time to, to wait. Keep in mind that a credit card today has a 90-day settlement period. So if we go from 90 days to 10 minutes, you can already see some of the gains we've had. Um, I think when you look at the overall development of technical progress globally, we are accelerating at an incredible pace. Uh, the iPhone was invented just uh, seven, eight years ago. And think about how um, the iPhone and the Android devices have completely changed the way we interact with each other. Text messaging has switched to just regular messaging. You can send photos and videos. A smartphone has replaced cameras, compasses, uh, calculators, your, the way you interact with media. Um, why can't money be digital too? And I think that we will see the rate of change move even more quickly. If you think about what happened just in the 19th century, um, we've experienced more change in the last 10 years than, than were experienced by people that lived over the last 100 years. And uh, that is going to continue to move quickly. Paradigm shifting changes now happen in 12 months not a decade, not 100 years, or before that 500 years. And so uh, I think while some of that may sound a little scary, um, I think overall the opportunities that these present should be really exciting, especially to millennials and younger people who have grown up as digital natives. Um, there was a famous uh, report that was released this year by Goldman Sachs, one of the largest investment banks in the world. They did this research and they asked a bunch of millennials, um, whether or not they thought they would have a bank account in five years. And 33% of millennials said no. So 33% of millennials don't think they'll have a bank account in five years. If there are 2.5 billion people that don't have access to financial services, period, where are they going to get their banking services? I think that they can just download some software, put it on their phone, just like they do for messengers and other things, and start to transact with each other. And so that's why we're seeing such strong growth. And uh, that's why I think especially younger people are particularly excited. But I'm hopeful we can get a lot more other people excited too. Um, what about taxation problems and uh, anonymity problems in Bitcoin network? So there's a misconception that Bitcoin is an anonymous payment network. Um, it's not anonymous at all. And let me explain. When a transaction happens between two people, it gets broadcasted to the Bitcoin blockchain where you've got copies of that transaction history um, all over the world. And uh, those transactions are totally auditable and perfectly public. So that means everyone in the world can research the global open ledger. They just don't actually know who's on either side of those. So Bitcoin behaves a little bit like a cash transaction. It's just digital. And uh, there's a good reason for us to have uh, a digital way of doing cash transactions. We believe um, very fundamentally that privacy is an important aspect in all types of interactions. It's why we should be able to openly have dialogue um, about cool books and interesting uh, political ideas or new philosophies. In the same way, um, we should have privacy in how we transact with each other. There's a balance there, of course, and uh, I think regulators are taking a thoughtful approach, especially across Europe and the United States toward this. Bitcoin is not illegal anywhere in the world except for North Korea, which is, uh, I think, a telling of the type of government that they have there and the way they approach innovation. Um, and you know, over the course of time, this presents m way more opportunities than, uh, than things that people should be worried about. So it's like with the cash. If I'm a good person, I declare my income, sure. be it in cash, bitcoins, or US dollars. 
Yeah, the, the, the legal and regulatory scope over Bitcoin is, uh, is evolving constantly and changing, and it's different from region to region. So some places treat Bitcoin like a property, other places treat Bitcoin like um, money, and uh, there's actually tax differences for each of those. So you should always consult um, with your local tax authorities. But if you earn your income in Bitcoin and your company um, reports their taxes, you're going to have to report your taxes. And uh, there's no difference for anyone that earns their wages uh, in dollars, euros, or yen. I've been earning my income in Bitcoin for three years now. I pay my taxes. Um, you know, it Do you pay your anything. salaries in your company in Bitcoin? Yeah, so uh, our employees get to choose whether they want to earn their salaries in Bitcoin or not. But I can tell you, when I run payroll, it is so much easier to do it in Bitcoin. No one has to wait. Payment receives instantly to the other side. And uh, for some of our employees, it's been a really exciting way uh, to actually earn some extra funds, especially as the price of Bitcoin has grown. Cool. Um, what about your company? Um, where do you need allies in what are you doing? If, if you talk about, uh, for example, startup people who want to join this movement, uh, does the world need more wallets or Bitcoin exchangers? Or what do you need, basically? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, my company is called Blockchain, which severely gets us confused with the key innovation. Um, but it's great for us, too, and gives us an opportunity to talk about what we do. So fundamentally... Could you start, please, uh, with where did you get your domain? So <laughs> blockchain.com, that is... Yeah, um, so the company's uh, namesake um, is obviously derived from the core innovation of Bitcoin. And when we launched the company in 2011, we asked the community what kind of service or what kind of things would they like to see. And uh, one of the things that needed to be developed was a site to explore the Bitcoin blockchain. And they, uh, we were asked what we should name this site. And we said, we'll just call it blockchain.info. Uh, so blockchain.info was our first um, project. And uh, it's essentially a search engine for looking at all the transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain. In 2012, we built wallet services. Wallets are just a way for you to send, receive, and secure Bitcoins. Um, we do that in a non-custodial way. So when you download and install a blockchain wallet on your phone, you are the sole custodian of the funds. My company has no access to that value, which means there's nothing to steal or compromise um, at blockchain. And then lastly, and most importantly, our company builds a developer platform. So one of the things we invest in aggressively are hackathons all over the world. Um, and that shouldn't be a scary thing. A hackathon is where developers get together and create and build exciting projects in a very specific period of time. So APIs are like recipes that developers can use to create new software. And we build and maintain uh, the most comprehensive set of Bitcoin APIs available for developers anywhere in the world to create exciting applications. And so um, if you are interested in building things in Bitcoin, you should definitely check out blockchain.info and go to our APIs and familiarize yourself with them. You could build a wallet that's mm -hmm. perfectly designed just for Ukraine or maybe um, a, a wallet that has a theme Does it make for sense? soccer fans. Does it make sense for countries to create kind of their own wallets? Um, I welcome competition from anyone, uh, and I think that uh, primarily my overall objective is to get more people using Bitcoin in general um, because of all the benefits that I think it has for folks. Um, so what do we need in this industry? We need more people to help us, and uh, oftentimes there's this... Uh, there are a lot of geeks in Bitcoin, which is really great, but we need people that have helped build consumer-facing services, that have expertise in marketing, that know how to do a better job building user experiences that are more familiar. Um, Bitcoin was uh, really of interest primarily to cryptographers and computer scientists the first few years. And while that was really important because some of the smartest people in the world were working on it, um, those are sometimes not the best people to take a product um, to market. You need to have a community of, uh, of software teams to do that. And so, you know, I think Bitcoin represents the most important learning opportunity of our generation. It's why I fly around the world and barely sleep and constantly am obsessed with sharing what we're working on. And so um, we need more people to participate. And, you know, if you're looking at where to invest your time and uh, you're a young person and where you want to work on your career, um, I think working in fintech and specifically in digital currency, Bitcoin and blockchain is probably the best place you can spend your time. And uh, investors think so too. That's why in the last year, Bitcoin was the number one most invested in tech vertical period. Of all the other places that some of the smartest uh, venture capitalists could have placed their money, they put it into Bitcoin. 
Um, so, and I'm talking... And you are being backed by some VCs, don't you? Yeah, so um, my company raised an industry-leading round, uh, over $30 million, about um, just over a year ago. And uh, we uh, were led uh, by a couple uh, prominent venture capital firms, including Lightspeed out of California, Wicklow Capital, Richard Branson's a major shareholder in the company, and many more. And I think it's important to note that um, when you see a large fundraising into something, uh, that's not really a bet. It's a vote of confidence. And they want to see um, those teams build amazing services and products that really fundamentally grow quickly and have a potential for massive impact. And uh, that's why companies in Bitcoin are raising huge, for, uh, huge rounds of money. Uh, well, does it make any sense to create alternative kind of private blockchains or alternative cryptocurrencies? So uh, one of the debates um, that's happened over the last year is that there are teams and companies um, that are trying to launch alternatives. Uh, and so the Bitcoin network being completely open source can be forked, which means you can actually copy it and make changes and launch a brand new network. The difference is, though, you don't automatically get the entire community to come along with you. So you have to do something that's really persuasive. And so far, um, many of these alternative Bitcoin implementations um, have not been very successful. And they're good sandboxes uh, for tinkering and trying new things. And I think what's neat about that is Bitcoin is software, which means it can improve. You can update it. Um, you can launch uh, improvements to the network. And based on the things that are happening um, in these alternative currencies, we can kind of bring some of the best learnings back to Bitcoin. And so, uh, in my point of view, if you um, want to stay true to the core principles of uh, Bitcoin as a project, which is a global peer-to-peer -peer cash system that's decentralized, that allows anyone in the world to participate, the Bitcoin project is probably the most exciting one. It's where all the venture capital is. It's where the leading minds in distributed technology and cryptography are investing their time. And um, that's what I'm focused on. Uh, there will be fit-to-purpose technology that um, may be useful for banks and clearing houses and other financial services, but they can go get an Oracle database that's sharded to go do those things. And you know, I'm excited about Bitcoin because if you want to take advantage of an army of computers all over the world to help keep a network secure, there is not a more powerful system than the Bitcoin blockchain. And you can't just replicate that instantly by copying and forking the code. What about governments who try to issue money based on blockchain technology? There are a few in the world. Yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, I expect um, that uh, central banks will actually go to digital money at some point in the next five to 10 years. Um, it's more practical. Um, they'll have more controls and more optics into monetary velocity. And uh, that's, um, I think, probably a good move. And We'll see which way that goes. Uh, they may not call it a cryptocurrency. They may just call it the digital dollar or the digital pound. And uh, I think ultimately there will be um, government issued digital currencies. There'll be digital currencies that are issued by banks, um, by companies as forms in the form of reward points and programs. And all of these things will exist um, and they'll compete with each other. And I think Bitcoin will be one of the more important ones in that space, primarily because it's been first to market and it's solving a lot of the scalability issues before these other uh, projects come online. But um, there have been uh, positive statements uh, by the Bank of England, by the US Federal Reserve and others. The Canadian government experimented with a digital currency. Um, and so I think it's just a matter of time before uh, they follow suit. But they're going to be more conservative. They're going to take a lot of time to research and understand the implications, study the economics. And they have a different set of interests in some ways. What is the chance that Bitcoin becomes a reserve currency? <laughs> um, that I'm not sure about. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I kind of just see it as a, as a way for people right now potentially to sort of hedge against other risks and other currency volatility. And so um, I'm not necessarily, uh, it, it'd be inappropriate for me to provide investment advice. Um, but imagine if you had an opportunity to invest in the internet itself by buying some shares of it. Um, back in the 1980s. That's a little bit like what you can do now with Bitcoin. And so, you know, people should never invest more money into anything than they're willing to, to walk away from. So they need to be careful, especially in the service providers that they sign up for. Um, just like in any industry, there can be scams and there can be malicious actors. Um, and so 
when you sign up to use an online service, make sure they have an About Us page. Check to see that they've been in the media, that they have reputable leaders, that they've been invested in, that it, um, you know, they have a sound regulatory and compliance program. And then you can protect yourself a little bit from the downside risks of just signing up to a, a random internet website. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting. Uh, people actually want to know, how can I earn money with <laughs> Bitcoin? Yeah, so that's kind of a neat question. Uh, if you're a freelancer, if you're a programmer or an artist, um, you can just start to accept Bitcoin. You just download a wallet and you can post your address right on your website and people can send you payments. Um, that's how easy it is to use. There are also some companies now that will uh, convert your wage into Bitcoin. So um, if you earn uh, regular uh, euros or yen or dollars or whatever, any currency, there are global exchanges that will change that value and send it into Bitcoin for you. Um, so that's kind of a, a cool idea. But you know, basically, you can ask your employer. I think that's one of the best ways to get Bitcoin is just tell them, hey, I'd like to get paid in Bitcoin. And if enough people ask, there's a good reason for the employer to do it too. They can instantly send payments without having to have the headache of running as much banking services through their company. HR departments tend to really like that. Uh, okay, I, I think the question was about speculation on Bitcoins. But anyway, you answered <laughs> <laughs> a better version okay. of that. <laughs> um, uh, we have kind of a technology question. Um, what is your opinion as to increasing the size of the block to two megabytes? Okay, um, so one of the proposals to help increase the volume of the Bitcoin blockchain, so one of the things we talked about earlier is that right now um, you can only do about six or seven transactions a second and there's so much volume on the Bitcoin blockchain that we're kind of reaching capacity levels in its current implementation. So there's a proposal to move the block size limit, which is the total number of transactions that can fit every 10 minutes into the Bitcoin blockchain from one megabyte to two megabytes. Um, my company's public position on this is that we stand behind a block size increase and we want to see the community form some consensus on this topic and show that we can invest and improve and manage development and uh, overall scalability of the Bitcoin blockchain. So um, in general, we find consensus, let's get to a bigger block size. Uh, okay, we have a cool IT site, it's called rumian.org and people from there ask uh, whether you participated in major prod, uh, uh, projects with world, any world banks. Uh, what are the use cases in, in banking? Sure, so um, nearly a hundred banks have now created innovation labs, invested in Bitcoin or blockchain companies um, and are starting to explore proof of concepts. Um, for providing digital banking services using Bitcoin and other digital assets. Um, I think it will take some time um, because these organizations are historically very conservative. Think of them a little bit like a super tanker. Those guys just don't change direction very quickly. But when they do, after a few years, they can be in a really different place. Um, so my point of view right now is that we've done a huge amount of education. We're still um, you know, open to helping uh, anyone that wants to learn more about how they can take advantage of these things. Um, blockchain at my company has had conversations with over 100 banks um, and our conversations are a range uh, across a variety of topics, but primarily um, we especially like to introduce them to our APIs because whether you're an individual or a very large financial institution, um, that's where you can start to get your developers to experiment, whether it's just looking at the price building a system um, for studying balances, tracking uh, just key statistics on uh, the Bitcoin blockchain, or more excitingly, hoping uh, and building exchanges or ATMs or things that allow your users to acquire Bitcoin. Um, those are things that uh, we like to work on. So I think that uh, if we look just a few years um, into the future, we will see more and more adoption and more and more legitimacy brought to the market by these larger financial institutions. Um, they want to serve their customers as more and more people ask for things like Bitcoin integration, then you can expect more and more banks to take it seriously. Uh, let's be honest and try to talk about dangers of Bitcoin. Will you tell us, for example, about the case with Silk Road? Sure. Um, so there have been some relatively famous uh, dramatic incidents in Bitcoin. Um, probably the two most famous uh, in, uh, in the industry um, were the Silk Road and then separately um, the failure of a company called Mt. Gox. So um, 
just like a lot of new industries uh, that are in, uh, that happen, you, you get a lot of really interesting people uh, and smart ones, and you get some people that try and take advantage of situations. Um, so I'll cover the Silk Road case quickly. Uh, the Silk Road was a large um, dark marketplace that you had to access using uh, the anonymizing uh, service called Tor, and you could shop online and purchase uh, narcotics, and they required that you use Bitcoin in order to purchase things there. Um, and it was a very large marketplace. Uh, and it was very popular. The United States government acted against the entity in 2013 um, and shut it down. And uh, there's an ongoing investigation and in case into this um, because you've had uh, one of the, the founders of it was uh, proven to be guilty of certain things, but and some of the people that were prosecuting him were actually uh, stealing bitcoins um, that were working for the government. So it's a really complex case. But uh, long story short, the authority figures have um, already proven to have all the tools necessary to prosecute bad actors um, in the industry. We already have uh, courts and we know how to deal with fraud um, when it comes up. So, you know, when you sign up for a service, whether it's an email service provider, um, whether it's uh, a content uh, service like Netflix or anybody else, just make sure that you do a little bit of diligence. Um, you know, make sure the service you're signing up for has a reputation, that they have strong it's security. It's like with, with cash. It's just it's like with cash. Mt. Gox was a separate case. Um, you had a company that was basically controlling a whole lot of access to people's Bitcoins. So Mt. Gox had a security design that collected everybody's funds or private keys. And uh, when you do that, just like whether you're collecting personal information or access to people's money, when you collect a lot of it in one place, um, you increase the incentives to hack or breach that service. And so. As a consumer, if you're interested in Bitcoin, I really recommend that you sign up or look into services that allow you to personally control access to your money. So think of it a little bit like having a wallet in your back pocket. What you put in there is your personal responsibility, but at least you're the one that has control over the management of that. You can sign up for effectively a Bitcoin bank, but then you're putting your trust in that institution. So the risk profile is mostly around whether or not you want to trust a service provider or whether or not you want to trust yourself. And you can sign up for Bitcoin services in either camp. Um, the point, from my point of view, though, was for individuals to always control access to their funds. It's a, it's a better risk uh, management system, better security, uh, from my point of view. But you have to set up really good passwords. You need to use things like two-factor authentication. Um, those increase your security. If we believe in Bitcoin, uh, what major steps should be done in this world to get this thing really big? Right. So I always like to think um, a little bit about where we've come from and then sort of use that as a guiding uh, roadmap for where we'll need to go. So if we look at just over the last five years, um, the level of adoption in the industry and the rate of growth, um, five years ago, uh, basically the total number of people that were interested in Bitcoin was maybe 10,000. Um, and those people were uh, you know, highly technical. Um, most of them uh, were uh, cryptographers or computer scientists, developers and programmers around the world. And uh, in 2011, you had uh, some companies get formed and get some angel funding. Among uh, them was my company. And they started to build uh, services uh, for consumers. Then you had merchants come in and start to adopt Bitcoin. You had more money pour in the, the industry. You've had regulatory clarity, especially out of um, Europe and the United States, uh, that's been very positive for the most part. And um, now we're at a point where we have proven that the system can run without fail for six years, that people can send value anywhere in the world and trust that it happened with 100% certainty. We still need to build better software, though. Um, I think we, as an industry, kind of got out a little uh, ahead of ourselves in some ways. But um, that investment is starting to pay off. And basically, there's always latency in software development. You start working on a project. It takes time to get to market. You build better interfaces. You optimize and improve them. And uh, I think 2016 is going to be incredibly exciting. You're coming up on a huge surge in the value of Bitcoin over the previous year. You have a lot of money that's gone into software teams to build better experiences. And um, I think the next steps are primarily uh, just focusing on the customer. And it's always that simple. If you can do something more efficiently and more effectively at a better cost, and consumers are eventually going to move in that direction. 
And uh, Bitcoin provides an exciting way for anyone in the world to send value to each other. And it's impossible for any of the other payment networks to provide a complimentary service at cost. And so uh, that's why we're seeing growth in Bitcoin. And uh, I think we'll see an acceleration of that over the next few years. Right now, there are maybe 10 million people in the world um, that have a Bitcoin wallet. What countries that are leaders in this moment? So um, the kind of fastest growing markets uh, based on what we've seen, um, originally it was uh, clear that, you know, sort of United States and Europe were sort of leading um, in that. Uh, but now it's growing very, very quickly across uh, Eastern Europe and Sa uh, Latin and South America, countries like Argentina, where you have high inflation, uh, weak trust in the economy and institutions, capital controls that are uh, preventing people from managing their funds. That's a ripe country for a digital value transfer system. And countries that have properties like that, wherever they are in the world, um, are going to be really uh, the first ones um, where I think adoption will happen. And so those are kind of key indicators that we're always looking at. Um, in the last year, you had the Greek uh, crisis, you've had issues in Cyprus, um, Puerto Rico, and many other countries. And I think as those local situations flare up and people are looking for places to store and secure value, um, Bitcoin is going to present the obvious solution for them. And so th over the coming years, um, those will be places that are exciting. But anywhere that you've got high penetration of cell phones, technically fluent people, um, decent access to uh, cell networks, that's going to be a perfect place for Bitcoin to be uh, successful. Uh, where is your team based? So um, we are uh, growing and hiring like crazy. So uh, it's nonstop. But um, we have our European headquarters in London and a sister office in New York. And uh, if you're interested in um, anything we're doing, please visit blockchain.com. Uh, you can see the open positions we have. We, uh, what is the uh, scenario there? How many resumes do you screen <laughs> to get a candidate? Yeah, um, we, we are very picky about um, who we get to work with. And uh, we're very lucky. We, we get a huge flood of resumes every single day. But um, we want to make sure we hire um, people that are all in, that really believe in this, that want to do some world-changing work, um, that want to work in really complex areas of cutting-edge computer science, that want to build beautiful customer uh, experiences and be challenged doing things that no one's ever done at scale before. Um, so we probably uh, screen over a thousand candidates um, for every single position wow. we hire. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, and how many interviews you have? <laughs> Um, I'd have to look at the conversion of those, but uh, anyone that's going to apply a blockchain is going to expect to have to go through many, many interviews. One in a thousand. That's <laughs> well, but um, anyway, uh, our viewers can go to blockchain.com website, see your... Uh, yep, go to the About Us page, and at the bottom you'll see the uh, open positions. Open positions and apply. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, if it is London, wh why not Silicon Valley? <laughs> um, so... The company was actually founded originally in the United Kingdom, and uh, we were entirely bootstrapped. Um, so we used to live in a small two-bedroom apartment in uh, northern England, and uh, that was actually a good place for us when we were a young um, startup. And so we were able to really focus. We have a lot of friends in Silicon Valley. Our lead investor is from uh, Silicon Valley. But we don't necessarily think that that's the best place um, to grow this business. Uh, we see the opportunities um, from a much more global perspective. And uh, in our company, we have uh, about 45 employees today, 15 different nationalities in our company. If you come into our office... Any Ukrainians among them? Uh, we do not have anyone from the Ukraine yet, so we'd love to add that. Um, but if you come into our office, it sounds a little bit more like the United Nations. People are talking in different languages. You've got French, Spanish, Java, all these other ones. Um, and uh, I think that that really comes to the core of what we're trying to do, which is uh, it's our mission to build the Bitcoin-powered open financial platform for the future. And uh, that requires having a very different perspective, and I think one that's not in an echo chamber. Where do you personally spend your Bitcoins? <laughs> so I earn my uh, income in Bitcoin, and um, I spend my Bitcoins um, for uh, coffee shops. I buy uh, many of my flights in Bitcoin. So do you have kind of a map? How, yeah. how do you find those places? Great question. So if you log into um, a wallet uh, like ours at blockchain.info uh, or blockchain.com, we actually have a merchant directory. So we have found uh, merchants all over the world that accept Bitcoin, and we put a little pin on the map. So anywhere you're traveling, you can locate places nearby that accept Bitcoin. And if there's a merchant out there that's not on the list, please get in touch with us. We'd love to add you or feature you in a blog uh, post. How to do that? How to get in touch with you? So um, you can uh, contact me on Twitter. It's N-I-C 
C A R Y, Nick Carey, or follow us at Blockchain on Twitter. Um, likewise, uh, we've got um, support email addresses. You can contact us at any time. Okay, great then. Uh, Nicholas, would you like to add anything to our conversation? Um, I guess only that uh, I'm really grateful for being able to come and, and share a little bit more. And uh, you know, I've watched some of the incredible innovations that Prebot Bank has been working on over the last year. I'm very excited for um, you guys being open to, to learning more and, and sharing a bit more about what you'll be building in the future as well. Um, you know, as for me, uh, I have traveled a lot in um, trying to find use cases for Bitcoin adoption. And I can say unconditionally, um, I think Ukraine has probably one of the strongest Bitcoin communities anywhere in the world. And uh, I guess I really shouldn't be surprised, but it's been really exciting. Um, I've spent the last few days, I've been in Lviv for a Bitcoin conference. I was in Kiev yesterday. Um, and uh, there are really thoughtful, really intelligent people working on making sure that we have um, an open and uh, more efficient way to send value all over the world. And so um, I'm looking forward to investing more in the community here and uh, hopefully bringing more and more people into the, the community of Bitcoin. Okay, great. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, thank you, everyone, for watching us. We'll reply all the comments. Uh, and also we'll keep inviting new guests right here to Privat Bank headquarters in Dnipropetrovsk to have more interesting conversation. Uh, let's continue talking in the comments section and on Facebook. Thank you everyone. Cheers. Bye. See you.